Today's event is part of a series of initiatives organized uh, by the Center I direct, so CSUC, in collaboration with our sister centers, uh, meaning uh, the Center for Russian and Eastern European Studies and the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies, under the aegis of the newly established Wiser Center for uh, Europe and Eurasia, and also in cooperation with the Center for Chinese Studies. And in this series, we try and set the events of 1989 in a larger conceptual and geographical context by linking right, that fateful year, uh, or, you know, now it's 20 years ago, to other events that have uh, spawned new kinds of political imagination and also challenged the structures of power of the day. And it so happens that so many of these events have taken place at the end of decades, right? So you have 1789 in France and 1919 in you know, throughout Europe, 1929 on Wall Street, but of course with repercussions around the world, 1949 in China, 1979 in uh, uh, Iran and Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. Hence the title of the series, The Nines, Brings, Cusps, and Perceptions of Possibility from 1789 to 2009. So this is, in a sense, right a way of reflecting on the very experience of what constitutes an event with its uh, anticipation, its explosion of possibilities, and often with its final narrowing down of possible options. So today we have the, the opportunity to reflect on one of the most dramatic nines, quote unquote, in recent history, at least in recent European history, meaning NATO's intervention in uh, Kosovo and Serbia in 1999 and its consequences, above all, for Kosovo itself. So this event, in a sense, started uh, 10 years before, in 1989, when uh, uh, Serbian leader Slobodan Milosevic repealed Kosovo's status of relative autonomy within the Federal Republic of Serbia in what was to, uh, back then Yugoslavia, and was completed, as far as these processes have a completion, which, you know, probably maybe they don't, uh, was completed almost 10 years after uh, NATO's intervention in uh, 2008 with Kosovo's declaration of independence. So through this painful and uh, also, of course, often uh, violent process, many different scenarios were imagined and fought for. Uh, some people tried hard to avoid uh, uh, Serbian military intervention, for example, and for a long time, different degrees of autonomy remained on the table as an alternative to violence. So this is indeed a story of, a story of possibilities imagined and lost as well. And nobody has done more than uh, our guest today, Vetan Suroy, to document and steer this process in a more democratic and inclusive direction, both as a journalist and as a political leader. So we're you know, very excited to have him here today. And to tell you uh, more about him, uh, we have the good fortune, I guess the sheer coincidence, <laughs> to have with us an expert of and eyewitness to Kosovo's recent history. So Michael McClellan is a senior uh, foreign service officer and also a diplomat in residence at the Ford School in Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. He has uh, a very uh, rich and diverse, uh, uh, he's had a rich and diverse uh, diplomatic career. And among many other accomplishments, he opened the first US diplomatic office in in Kosovo in 1996 and was the first U.S. diplomat to serve there. He then returned in 2000, so the year after uh, the military intervention. So he spent, uh, if I, you know, I'm not mistaken, a total of five and a half years of service in Kosovo. So indeed, it's hard to imagine a more uh, qualified person for this introduction. So please welcome Michael McClellan. Thank you, Mr. Gaggio. And I especially want to thank the Center for European Studies and the European Union Center for hosting today's event. I am especially honored to introduce to you today Mr. Vetan Saroy and to welcome him to the University of Michigan. When I first met Vetan back in 1996, Kosovo was a little known province of Serbia in what was left of Yugoslavia. I had just opened the first U.S. office in uh, June of 1996, and I was the only diplomat at that time from any country assigned to Kosovo. I am especially pleased that it was the U.S. that, uh, that opened the first uh, diplomatic presence in Kosovo because it was clear proof of our concern for the human rights issues that were at play there at that time. Kosovo was a place that few Americans had ever heard of, much less knew anything about. 
but within a few short years, it would be known to virtually every American, and it would be Europe's newest state, recognized by most of the leading countries of the world. When I arrived there, I soon met Vetan, who at that time was involved with a small NGO that was training students in journalism. Since ethnic Albanian students were then unable to study in their language at the University of Pristina, the so-called parallel school system was vital to the community, and the role of NGOs was critical to ensuring that Kosovo's youth would be able to meet the challenges of political and economic development. By early 1997, Vetan had launched his newspaper, Koha di Tore, to bring a voice of independent journalism to Kosovo. While there was a very active Albanian language press in Kosovo at that time, all of those media were directly or indirectly under the control of the umbrella political movement, the Democratic League of Kosovo. Koha, however, was independent, and it showed its independent streak early on when it began to report on U.S. policy toward Kosovo. At that time, U.S. policy was clearly against independence. It was our stated policy at that time that Kosovo was and should continue to be a province of Serbia. However, Kosovo media would not report this to the ethnic Albanian public, but rather they continued to distort reporting to indicate that the U.S. did in fact support independence. Vetan's paper took the courageous step of reporting the truth, and it first did so by reporting in detail on a series of meetings that I held around Kosovo. This courageous step was just the first of many such instances in which Koha reported truth to power. Whether that power was the dominant ethnic Albanian political movement, later the United Nations mission in Kosovo, or on individual countries' policies and programs in Kosovo, including some of their strongest international supporters. Vetan also showed personal courage on more than one occasion in his role as editor of the leading newspaper and outspoken advocate of human rights. When Milosevic's forces began widespread ethnic cleansing in Kosovo, NATO acted quickly. As the bombing campaign began, Vetan stayed in Pristina, although many other leaders and intellectuals opted to flee as Serbian forces hunted them down and killed many of them. Hiding in various homes, Moving through the back streets at night, Vetan survived until liberation by NATO forces, always refusing to leave his native land. Not surprisingly, after Serbian forces were driven out of Kosovo, many acts of revenge were committed against Serbs and other non-Albanians as hundreds of thousands of Albanian refugees returned to their homes, many of them destroyed by Serbian forces. At great personal risk, and as a lone voice crying in the wilderness, Vetan stood up and denounced this violence publicly, denouncing Albanian fascism and saying that it was not for ethnic cleansing that, e that ethnic Albanians had struggled for the previous 10 years. In his writings and interviews, Vetan noted that, quote, we have to make a distinction between collective responsibility and collective punishment. This is a distinction that has since then been increasingly accepted across the political spectrum. Since that time, Vetan has continued to be active as both a journalist and a political leader, never fearing to speak truth to power. Through his Aura political party, his service in the Kosovo parliament, his leadership of the foreign policy club in Kosovo, through the pages of Koha di Tori and the broadcast of Koha TV, Vetan continues to be a voice of reason that promotes the values and ideals of Kosovo's European and American partners as the newly independent country of Kosovo seeks to become the newest member of Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, it is truly an honor and a pleasure for me to present an old friend, a voice of courage, a voice of reason, a voice of Kosovo, and a voice of Europe, Mr. Vetan Soroy. Ladies and gentlemen, Dario, Natasha, Mike, I am, uh, I didn't know I would have to travel for uh, so long to be humbled in, in Michigan. These are very warm words, and these are words uh, that I shall remember. 
um, because uh, as time passes uh, and we reflect uh, about the past, it is actually uh, those uh, moments of human warmth that we uh, remember most and that uh, continue uh, with us uh, in our lives. This especially in, a, in times of trouble, and God knows I've gone through uh, many years of them. Um, I, I used to live in Mexico, and that's where I studied. Uh, and in 1982, I decided to go back uh, home, uh, and I enrolled in journalism. Uh, at the time, I started as a young journalist. Uh, and as I like saying, uh, I was looking for trouble uh, as a journalist. And after some time, trouble was looking for me. Uh, and this has been uh, almost uh, 20 years of it. In 1989, um, I was uh, a journalist that was banned from writing. Uh, I was a journalist in my uh, in the only Albanian daily newspaper, Rilindia. I was banned from writing because a year before I had an interview with a distinguished uh, Croatian um, intellectual, Branko Horvat, who wrote a book uh, saying that uh, the Kosovo Albanians should not go to prison uh, when asking for a status of a republic. The question of the status of the republic is a question of a constitutional debate and not uh, a question for the policemen or the courts uh, to be sent to see people. In 1981, 1982, the Kosovo Albanians were asking for a status of republic, and uh, more than 2,000 of them were sentenced to very long-term jails. By 1989, when I, I was banned from writing, 700,000 uh, Albanians had gone gone through one or the other form of police procedure. That's one in three uh, Kosovo Albanians had gone through some kind of brutal or repressive uh, treatment. Uh, 1989 was also the time of a constitutional paralysis of former Yugoslavia because Mr. Milosevic had decided to take uh, over the autonomy by brutal force. Uh, I saw that with my own eyes as I saw uh, police uh, armed vehicles in front of the parliament uh, uh, trying to convince the members of the parliament how they should vote. And evidently, uh, we know how the vote would, would come uh, out. It was a time when the miners of Trepsha had gone to a hunger strike. Uh, and after that, a state of emergency was installed. And it was a time when I had first found out about something called isolation. Uh, it was an extra legal procedure uh, by which the police was allowed to take people for 60 days in detention, uh, and all of them, most about 250 of them, people who the police had thought were organizing demonstrations, had been taken into, 60, uh, into custody for 60 days, beaten uh, roughly, and then released uh, after that uh, period of time. In, in the midst of all of that, I suddenly decided I would take holidays. Uh, and so I went to Bulgaria, which was the only place I could afford uh, at the time uh, because of this uh, money exchange rate. They had this uh, black market rate. Uh, and there I saw the two uh, historical processes of Eastern Europe. Uh, on the one side, I saw the Bulgarian Turks who were packing, uh, being kicked out from the country because they would uh, uh, they did not change their names uh, into, into Slavic names. They wanted to keep uh, their names. And the second were Eastern Germans who were selling uh, all their belongings because they did not want to go back to East Germany. Uh, in fact, that was the summer where the East Germans, back from Bulgaria and from Romania, uh, parked themselves into Hungary, uh, and Hungary uh, actually gave them political asylum. Some months afterwards, the uh, Berlin Wall fell. So on the one side are the ethnic problems, and on the other side, the questions of liberty. And this is something that, that I saw uh, that year. At the end of that year, by some chance, by coincidence, um, I was involved into something called the Yugoslav uh, Democratic Initiative, which was the first uh, democratic opposition in uh, former Yugoslavia and the socialist Yugoslavia. And the basic idea of that movement was to ask for parliamentary elections at 
all levels in Yugoslavia, federal and Republican level. It was obviously against the state of emergency in Kosovo, and it was, uh, uh, of course, for a civilized dialogue on what the future of Yugoslavia ought to be of a democratic uh, Yugoslavia. I was in December of 1989, at the age of 28, I became the leader of the chapter of that uh, organization in Pristina, um, in effect becoming the first democratic organization uh, of Kosovo. Uh, people were expecting so much of that kind of organization that a week after, I was invited by um, unemployed construction workers or, or people who were kicked out from, from, from their jobs uh, to their meeting, and I stood at the podium and I suggested that they should form a trade union, and this is how the independent trade unions were formed. You would just say one thing and it just happened. This is, this was, these were the, or this was the year of magic when things became transformed. And a week after that, the uh, Democratic League of Kosovo, under the leadership of Dr. Ibrahim Rugova, would be formed. This would be a very big organization, uh, becoming the umbrella of a national movement, and on the one side and on the other side of a movement of self-determination. Self now, in January of 1990 and in February of that year, 30 people were killed in demonstrations. Uh, the organization that would 30 Albanians, uh, and this was becoming habitual. It was almost a daily occurrence that we would have demonstrations. The police would come in, shoot, kill, and it would be repeated tomorrow and the day after. And uh, the, the basic paradigm was a spiral of violence uh, in which uh, the resistance at the time, uh, organiza clandestine organizations with Marxist-Leninist background were, were doing, uh, and the police was responding violently. And the way we saw it as, as leaders of a democratic movement was that we needed to stop the spiral of violence because we would be losing more and more people and, and the effect would be simply the same, uh, but at the same time continue with uh, resistance. Um, and at, the, at that time, there was a curfew uh, that prohibited uh, many things, among them that more than two people assemble on the street, uh, and that at 7 p.m. everybody uh, stayed at, at home. At that exact moment, we decided uh, as a coordinating movement of democratic forces that we should, con we should use this curfew as a form of peaceful resistance. And therefore, we invited people to take a walk uh, in the street uh, at one exact time, at 3 p.m., and that at that exact time, they stopped for two minutes. And at the moment when you had tens of thousands of people in the street at the same time, we broke the curfew of, more, of assembling of more than two people. In the evening, when they asked that that people stay at home. We also ask that people stay at home, but we ask them to turn off their lights and to light candles. And this way we show that there was light at the end of this uh, very dark uh, process that had started with repression. We also ask them to take out their keys and to make noise with the keys. And in the area of the night, you will hear only keys and the candles. And the keys were a sign that we had a solution we had the keys to get out of that situation. And that way we created a peaceful, nonviolent pattern of resistance that, would, that was actually a strategic choice. We had, some of us had thought about it, some of the, us had believed in it and believe in it. Uh, but the strategic decision for nonviolence was uh, at one point, when you have to make choices, uh, there's, there's, uh, the choices are not easy. The choice was either to, to go to war, to use terrorism, to use violence, or to use nonviolence. In terms of occupation, there aren't the, you cannot have the benefit of sitting and saying, well, we'll just see what, what, what happens. Uh, you cannot do that. That is not a choice. For us, war or terrorism was not a choice. Uh, 
A, because we did not believe in it, in, in human damage. Um, B, because it would legitimize a Serb position uh, as an anti-terrorist uh, gesture. Therefore, we did not want to be appearing as a side that is inciting in any way terror or violence. And if we had used any of these means, it would delegitimize our position. We did not want to be on par with Serbia that was using both state terror and violence against us. Uh, the second, uh, uh, the second uh, uh, motive for this decision was evidently that we needed to shift entirely the paradigm of the way pol politics uh, was conducted in Kosovo throughout the 20th century. We needed Western support. And we needed clear Western support. And the way to get that Western support was actually to advocate a path that would not be identifiable as violent and separatist. Uh, and regardless of the fact that we did not have support until very late in, in the 90s, uh, this was an initial way of actually gathering support uh, from, from the West. And the third motive was that we needed to have a cohesion of the Albanians in Kosovo. Throughout the 20th century, the Albanians had been divided about what they want and how they want the things, the Kosovo Albanians. And this was the first time when we could actually uh, create a platform that would have everybody on board and everybody on board for what we felt were going to be very difficult times uh, ahead. And these were all unparalleled steps uh, in the history of the Kosovar Albanians, or indeed of the Albanian people in the Balkans. With this, we created a strategic advantage. Uh, once we had this cohesive element within our society, there was a decision that we should declare uh, our rights of self-determination in a, a way in which it would, it would coincide within the uh, constitutional dialogue in Yugoslavia, so our parliament declared it uh, in the street because the, the speaker of the parliament had the keys to the parliament, did close the door and did not allow for MPs to come in. Well, the MPs said that the parliament is everywhere because they are MPs and not the, the building. And so they were right in front of the building and they declared that Kosovo would be independent if all the other republics were independent or it would be part of Yugoslavia as an equal republic if all the other republics decided to do so. Um, despite the serious handicaps uh, at that time, uh, this cohesion and, uh, had created uh, the possibility to form what were known as parallel institutions. Soon after the July 2nd declaration, uh, there was a crackdown from uh, Milosevic. 120,000 people were kicked from their jobs. At that time, there were 240,000 employed altogether. Uh, so half of the workforce was expelled from the jobs. The schools were closed, or the schools in Albania were closed. And all the teachers were expelled from their jobs. All the Albanian teachers were expelled uh, and, and from public uh, finance. So uh, immediately, we created what was what would become known as a parallel system of education, and that happened in health. Uh, we created a system of financing from our own uh, population and from the diaspora. The diaspora was paying a 3% of their wage to a special fund, and this is how our education and health survived for almost 10 years. Uh, in, in a cohesive manner, in a way in which it was never actually disrupted. Um, we also gained a strategic advantage at that time of being clearly identified as the nonviolent ent entity of Yugoslavia. At times when, when wars and when news of war came from Yugoslavia, we were the nonviolent side. We had a leader who soon became known as the Gandhi uh, uh, of the Balkans. Uh, albeit a, a bit more passive than, than Gandhi, but uh, still uh, a man who, uh, who gained respect throughout uh, the world. Uh, and there was, when one turns the back, uh, one turns his, his eyes back into the history, we gained uh, something very important, which is 
keeping uh, the country out of the first wave of wars of former Yugoslavia. Uh, the wars had started. Uh, there was an enormous destructive capacity within the Yugoslav army. And those who fought first uh, got uh, the, the worst uh, of it, uh, with the exclusion of Slovenia, which had a quick war. Uh, Croatia uh, got, uh, received a lot of destruction, and certainly Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, had received the worst uh, of it. Uh, had Kosovo gone to war uh, in those instances, uh, there would be no international support uh, for Kosovo. Mm, Yugoslavia was still a fresh case, and there would be a wave of destruction uh, against civilian population that would not receive uh, probably any uh, attention uh, at, at all. Of course, there was also a strategic weakness to our uh, policy of uh, nonviolence, uh, because our nonviolence, uh, which was also quite passive after some, some time, we did not go around with, with keys or with candles or anything. For some years, we stay put. Uh, but nonviolence uh, actually has uh, a, a, its own limitations uh, in terms of uh, contradicting a classic occupation. And this is what we were uh, facing. Uh, at some point, uh, a passive nonviolence actually is comfortable for the occupying force because they can actually control that place with uh, very few. Uh, forces focusing on other areas, which is what happened with uh, Serbia. Uh, furthermore, furthermore, it was shown as a, as a weakness when Dayton happened. And this was an awareness for uh, the population in general, because uh, despite our beliefs, the, the world functions in a rather cynical way. And you can be as nonviolent and peace-loving as, as much as you want, but actually in politics, uh, attention is paid when violence uh, happens. And this is what, uh, this is the lesson that was learned in, in Dayton. Uh, to the ex enormous tragedy of, of the Bosnian people, of all the Bosnian, of all the people of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, uh, and there was a danger in, in, our, in what was our strategic advantage. And that is the policy of nonviolence and this enormous cohesion and the identification with the leadership uh, at the time uh, could uh, actually corrupt uh, the idea of a negotiated nonviolent uh, settlement and could go to, into a fallback situation, which would be the Mar Marxist-Leninist organizations or the ex-Marxist-Leninist organizations taking over and conducting uh, policy and driving the whole political process uh, afterwards. Uh, we actually had some experience with uh, negotiations, and those negotiations, that experience was uh, cynical, uh, to say the least. Uh, we were invited to what was called the London Conference of Former Yugoslavia, and uh, the leadership was, uh, was invited there. Uh, there was a, a whole deal of propaganda uh, from our side that we were there, we were going to be equal participants. Well, when we arrived to London, they put us in the room uh, next to the journalist room, and we were watching the London conference from, t from the TV screen, which was not exactly participating in the conference. It was viewing the conference. We could have done that in Pristina. It was broadcast uh, live uh, anyway. Uh, then we had a, a, a position in negotiations that was at that time, important, uh, because we, uh, in lacking any other negotiating process, we agreed that we should focus on what were called practical issues. And the most practical issue was education. Now, education for Albanians, Kosovo Albanians, is extremely important. Because we are such a young society, 70 percent of our population is under 30, education involves everybody. Uh, and education uh, involves, at that time, involves about 300 and I think 40,000 or 50,000 pupils uh, and uh, uh, tens of thousands of, of teachers. So focusing on education was something that, and resolving this issue of education was something that we uh, invested in. Unfortunately, we, the, the negotiations started in 1993 in Geneva, and they did not produce anything for about 
three uh, years. At that uh, end, of, uh, at the end of those three years, one or two faculties were open, but then war uh, erupted because war would not wait for such a protracted period of discussion on on practical issues. And during that period, um, a track two negotiating process also happened, uh, mediated by uh, a German NGO, the strongest German NGO, the Bertelsmann Stiftung. And we would meet with uh, Serbs, uh, with Belgrade uh, Serbs in different places throughout Europe, uh, discussing what would be the framework of a future negotiation. And in those discussions, I, su I suggested that we should establish a two-step approach into resolving the Kosovar uh, crisis. Uh, the first approach should be, the first step would have to be to create a safe democratic environment in which institutions were built, uh, a status neutral kind of self uh, rule. Uh, and with that kind of step, then we would be ready as a society to enter uh, the next step, which would have been discussions on permanent status. I had the belief at the time that. Uh, pursuing a path that would say we should have discussions on independence now uh, or, ne or, uh, or not enter into any negotiations would not produce anything, simply because Serbia would say, well, we don't want to discuss independence uh, with you. And the international community did not have, at the time, any means of pressuring Serbia into a discussion on uh, status. Um, in, all, in these conditions, in, in 97, we already, or immediately after Dayton, we had the first guerrilla attacks on uh, Serb forces. Uh, there was then the, the usual spiral, which was the guerrilla attack, and then the police respond back, and then the guerrilla attack, and then the res police raises its response. Uh, and at some point uh, after 97 and 98, we already had the army actually shelling villages. Uh, which was increasing uh, the degree of uh, violent response. Uh, and uh, uh, it was quite evident that uh, we were entering uh, into a war uh, and that uh, there was uh, only way one way to stop it, and that was with the help of the international community, that there was no way our guerrilla force, uh, regardless of the fact that they were called an army, they were not an army, Kosovo Liberation Army was a group of, uh, a, a rather loose group uh, of guerrilla organizations that communicated uh, between themselves um, with no clear uh, military uh, leadership, uh, but with a clear idea that, uh, that they should continue provoking the Serb forces into more and more uh, reaction, because in that, that way we get international attention. Well, we did get international attention. And we did because it was the right historical moment, or if one wants to put it, it was the historical moment after wrong historical moments. Uh, the Clinton administration had faced uh, the Rwanda genocide, had not reacted to it, uh, had faced Bosnia, had uh, reacted very slowly uh, initially to it, uh, and afterwards uh, forcefully. Uh, and at, uh, in the State Department, there was uh, somebody who, who felt a great moral obligation in, in reaction that was Madeleine Albright. And there was a leadership within the U.S. administration on, on the issue of Kosovo. There was a clear leadership in Congress uh, at, at the time. Um, Vice President Biden is one of the, of the examples, but we had uh, Mitch McConnell uh, on the Republican side and Bob Dole uh, leading on the Republican side. It was a, uh, I think there was an awareness in the United States altogether that there is a need or an obligation to react. I think by that time, uh, it was a crucial moment of evolution in the U.S. Uh, on, on the um, on the, on the need to react, on the obligation to react in a humanitarian intervention. It was also a very good uh, um, uh, way of reacting in, in Europe. Uh, the U.S. found a, Euro a European, not only one, but many European counterparts. Uh, there was Tony Blair with a, an increasing 
uh, humanitarian uh, role uh, at the time. Uh, it was Chirac uh, that changed the paradigm of, of foreign policy in France. Uh, and then we had uh, Joschka Fischer in Germany, uh, who had deep beliefs into this. So uh, altogether, it was one of the best situations that you can find in, in history when you have transatlantic accord on uh, the reaction. Uh, the tr two tracks that I had proposed earlier actually, in an awkward way, went uh, through the, the NGO channels into the uh, foreign uh, policy uh, structures, uh, initially in Germany, and later within the contact group discussions in uh, these contact group uh, uh, foreign ministries. Uh, and they actually became the platform uh, for uh, Rambouillet. Uh, the approach was, let's try to create a period of time in which Kosovo gets a chance to create democratic institutions, uh, a nonviolent uh, two or three years, uh, and then have the possibility to actually make a decision with the help of the international community or with its mediation on the permanent status. It would also allow Serbia to get on the democratic path after so many years of wars uh, conducted against uh, other people. Well, we had two or three weeks of negotiations in Rambouye. It was a rather awkward um, negotiating process. We were closed in the castle. The castle was not what you would imagine. It's, it doesn't look like a, the, the, we have to share uh, the showers. Uh, you, you know, it's not the castle you would you would want it to be. Uh, uh, Milosevic did not participate in those uh, negotiations, which made matters even more difficult because the real power was in Belgrade, whereas we were negotiating with uh, his uh, his juniors. Uh, and to make matters even uh, more difficult, we actually did not know each other as a Kosovo delegation. The, uh, some of us had met for the first time when we when we went to Paris. Um, and these were people who, at some point, uh, also did not like each other very much. Uh, so uh, we had to spend uh, some layers of negotiations. One of them was to negotiate among ourselves, actually, to, to create a consensual uh, platform. Uh, these matters were actually difficult and became so difficult that, at the end, uh, I had to sign, although I was not a political leader, I had to sign in the name of our delegation because uh, I had created a formula that would involve everybody and, and consensualize actually our, our response, which was to say that we accept in principle, uh, not only in principle, but we do accept the document, but in order to sign it, we need to consult for another two weeks with our people. And a period of consultation started with the Kosovars, while Serbia refused clearly to, uh, to sign. Um, now, uh, you know, 10 years after, people say, well, uh, this was a difficult uh, issue for Serbia, and uh, the, the proposals were not unacceptable, et cetera. Uh, you know, for the, two, for the first two weeks of negotiations, the Serbian delegation actually drank and sang and was not involved in, in negotiations, because those were the instructions. Uh, the, the strong man was in Belgrade. He was not interested in the negotiation. He, he sent uh, a group of students who spent their time uh, enjoying uh, the castle as much as it could be uh, enjoyed uh, at the time. Uh, and only after, in the third week, did they actually engage in, in, in more negotiations, but uh, without a clear uh, intention to, to sign. Uh, after uh, Rambouillet, we came to, to Paris, uh, and in Paris there was a clear refusal uh, of, of the Serbian side, uh, although there was a growing awareness, uh, an explicit message from the contact group, including the Russians, that the matters were becoming so serious that a Serb refusal would uh, result in the bombing uh, of Serbia, uh, which had already started engaging in, in uh, war actions uh, in Kosovo. The response of the Serbian president, Mr. Milutinovic, uh, who was then, who spent some time uh, in The Hague uh, in, in the trial, was Kesera Sera. Uh, the 
Italian song, which, what, what shall be, shall be, uh, which was not a very wise uh, response because we had a, a bombing uh, campaign uh, that resulted in 78 days uh, in which uh, a lot of damage uh, was done. Many people were killed. I spent the uh, all the time there in, in Kosovo, and I saw uh, with my eyes what was uh, what was happening, the de determination of a regime to actually ethnically cleanse uh, a place was something that I had not believed existed. I believed there was hatred, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, when you see an organized society that wants to actually get rid of the other parts of the society, then you understand that evil has reached uh, a point which, in which it is not emotional. It becomes a mechanical uh, gesture. Um, the effects of Rambouillet are, were very important. Uh, first of all, because this was the contract, it was the first contract that the Kosovo Albanians had ever in their history signed uh, with the West, with the world, with international organizations. Um, the second was uh, because it actually was a, a true offer to prevent a further war. It was, uh, many people would say in Serbia that there were tricks inside. There were not, actually. It was a true offer that uh, at some point even was favorable uh, to Serbia because it would keep uh, even its uh, degree of its military and police presence in Kosovo for a certain period uh, of time. It would, be, it would be an easier transition to whatever the outcome would have uh, been. And the third factor was that the uh, uh, Rambouye became the basis for the resolution 1244, which ended the war uh, in Kosovo and uh, established a UN authority. Uh, and the unfortunate f fact is that no, the Kosovo Albanians did not participate in, or were not consulted at all on the resolution 1244, although it had to deal with them. Uh, one of the reasons was uh, Dr. Rogovo was kept hostage by Milosevic f until May, and when he was released, the antagonism between him and Mr. Thaci from the KLA was so great that they could not uh, uh, see eye to eye and, and actually uh, find a, a common uh, position. Uh, what 1244 in 1999 produced, and you will hear uh, on Kosovo, you'll always hear this is a precedent for that and this is a precedent for this, uh, but what the UN produced at the time was uh, the best example of constructive ambiguity, as they call it, in formulating uh, our lives. Now, uh, constructive ambiguity meant uh, basically overcoming any hard obstacle with more creative uh, language. Now, that's what poets do most of the time. Uh, but this is uh, an example of what uh, the UN was uh, trying to do. And what they did was say that uh, the Kosovo was, was within the Yugoslav sovereignty, although at the time even Yugoslavia was non-existent, but this is a, an act of poetic license. Uh, uh, so, but uh, and so that sovereignty, which was in the hands of Yugoslavia, would be handed over to the SRSG, which is the special representative of the Secretary uh, General uh, of the UN, and he was entitled to. He was the sovereign of uh, Kosovo. He had regal powers uh, much more than uh, any other leader uh, in this world, uh, from uh, hiring and firing the local postman uh, to uh, protecting the borders uh, of, of Kosovo. This was his scope uh, of uh, authority. It was an unprecedented uh, operation. I, in, Ju in June of 1999, when the war ended, uh, I saw how the whole operation started. It was three white uh, Land Rovers, or, or, ra or uh, space runners, I think, the Toyotas, that came from Skopje that had the first uh, SRSG, Sergio Vieira de Melo, uh, a very good diplomat, Brazilian diplomat, who would be later killed in, in Baghdad uh, in the first mission of the UN there. Uh, so at the time, you could see the difference between the military and the civilians and the fact that General Mike Jackson was rolling in with his tanks and with uh, 
tens of thousands of troops, whereas the civilian component that was supposed to run the country was entering in three jeeps. Uh, and that was basically how the disproportion was kept for a longer uh, period of time. Despite this rather chaotic uh, beginning of peace and end of war, uh, we had a million people, actually a million refugees, come back to their homes. And this is an unprecedented operation to actually reverse uh, ethnic uh, cleansing uh, in not only in Europe, but in, in the world. Uh, but uh, that reversal of ethnic cleansing was not also a reversal or was, it did not have its institutional basis. When these people came back uh, to their homes, there was a security vacuum. Uh, there were soldiers, NATO soldiers, but NATO soldiers were not policemen, and they could not police uh, uh, Kosovo, and they did not want to police Kosovo. That's not what they were trained for. Uh, there was no Kosovo police, there was, the Serbian police was out, uh, and there was no international uh, police. In fact, we were left with a, a vacuum that would continue un up until 2005, maybe, when the optimum level of police force was uh, established. Now, uh, this was a time when there were retributions and many bad things uh, happened. Uh, but this is not a Kosovo specialty. Uh, leave Ann Arbor without uh, cops for uh, a week, and you'll see uh, some shops demolished and, and, and some um, theft and some beatings, uh, because all you need is the first brick, uh, and that, then, then everything uh, takes its, its route. Uh, unfortunately, we are still feeling uh, the effects of that of that security vacuum. And this has been the most, one of the most important messages that when people ask me what the U.S. should be doing in Iraq, that was the first thing that I said, don't have a security vacuum, because then you will, you will feel it uh, many years uh, afterwards. Uh, the, the messy U.N. presence, uh, although it brought back uh, a million refugees, it also created, and because it was state building without a manual, it also created a situation in which Kosovo would increasingly become dysfunctional and not functional. Uh, a place in which there were dual competencies or three types of competencies in which you had the UN running uh, the show, uh, the Kosovar institutions or Kosovar elected officials, and even Serb parallel uh, institutions uh, functioning. This all created a galimatias of sorts uh, in which there was also a blame game. The easiest way for uh, demagogical pol politicians on the Kosovar side was to blame everything on the UN, and the easiest way for the UN administrators was to blame it uh, on the Kosovars. Uh, whilst things were actually paralyzed for a longer period uh, of time. Uh, I had an interesting uh, visit at that time in 2000, uh, seeing the first reactions and seeing the, how things were going wrong. I came to the U.S. and talked to the administration and said uh, that we should have a constitution uh, because it's abnormal that we should be ruled by one Security Council resolution. What we had in the first year or so was everything, every edict, every law that was uh, being pushed uh, was signed and said, this is under, under resolution 1244. Well, you cannot run a place uh, in, with a five sentences of a resolution. You need a more clearly established set of rules, and that set of rules should derive from a constitution. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have uh, one, we, because of lack of uh, initiative on the Kosovo side, we came into a situation to have the UN actually write a constitutional framework, as it was called, for us, and push it and say, well, sign it, this is yours. Uh, you're going to live uh, with, with it. Uh, we had a, a stagnation, and this was a stagnating society because of lack of, when you have too many uh, authorities, you have none. And this has been the, the lesson of, uh, of Kosovo in the first uh, far four or five years of the UN presence. Uh, and this whole thing erupted in 2004 when uh, there was an interpretation on the Albanian side that some kids uh, were killed 
by Serbs or by uh, Serbs instigating a dog, uh, chasing them with a dog in the river, and, and two kids died in the river. And, and this whole sparked riots on the Albanian side. And there were uh, uh, more than 20 people killed, both Serbs and Albanians, in those riots. And again, in a cynical way, this was a wake-up call for the international community in saying, wait a minute, we have to deal with, with, this, with this issue. What we had afterwards was the UN introspection saying that there should be a, a process of determining status, uh, status talks, uh, first with the report of the Norwegian diplomat Kai Eide, and then the start of the actual negotiations with President uh, Ahtisari. The President Ahtisari's uh, mission was uh, very delicate, uh, but he, uh, as a very seasoned diplomat and uh, negotiator, uh, actually created the conditions that his mission or, uh, become uh, much easier, or he thought so uh, in the beginning. The basic idea was to have uh, the contact group, which were the five Western powers plus Russia, um, uh, established the guiding principles of the negotiation, and those guiding principles affirmed basically uh, the path of Kosovo, which was no return to previous, uh, no, no status quo ante, uh, and a status that would respect uh, the, uh, the needs uh, of the people. Uh, that's in January of 2006, actually, the five Western powers and Russia declared that the, a settlement needs inter alia to be acceptable to the people of Kosovo. And evidently, there was no other uh, settlement that would be acceptable except uh, independence for which we had strived uh, until uh, then. Now, uh, in 2006, it looked like the status would not be what status, but what kind of independence. Uh, or to what degree would the international community be involved uh, in that uh, independence. Uh, Ahtisari's idea was to have an independence that was initially internationally supervised, and therefore he created uh, these formats of ULEX and ICO, the International Civilian uh, Office, that would basically oversee uh, the uh, independent uh, Kosovo for a certain period of time, especially in questions of minority rights. I was involved at the time negotiating the minority rights package. Uh, and uh, what I did uh, at the time with the help of a very good uh, German-British uh, scholar, Mark Weller, was establish the Community Con uh, Consultative Council, uh, invite the representatives of minority groups, and try to devise a minority rights package that would be uh, one that, would, that they would feel very comfortable with, that they thought was uh, something that would emancipate uh, their rights. Uh, and so we came to a joint uh, package through, uh, for more than a year and, and, and a half uh, of work that is now one of the models of minority rights in, in Europe. It is something that in the Council of Europe, actually people show and say, this is how minority rights uh, should look like, uh, albeit in, it's in paper, but, uh, but nevertheless, it's something that is uh, quite uh, elaborate. Uh, just to illustrate, uh, the Roma people, uh, the gypsies, uh, in this minority right package have the right to use their language in the municipalities in where they live. Now, with the exception of Macedonia, there is not one single country in Europe that actually has that provision. Uh, the Turks, who represent 0.8% of the population, have the right to address the authority in the Turkish language and have the right to be responded back in that language. Now, that's something that no other European country has. And this is something that we uh, included uh, in our package, and this is something that was taken by the international community and demonstrated as a sign of goodwill of the Kosovo people to actually have an independence that is not only for the Albanian people, but for the citizens of Kosovo, and especially for those who are in a minority uh, 
position. Uh, unfortunately, the whole package, including the minority rights, which is about 70% of the Arctic Saudi package, was not endorsed by the Security Council, although it was endorsed by the U European Union. Even though it was endorsed by the European Union, five countries of the European Union did not recognize the independence, although our independence is based on the Atisari package. But these are uh, questions that have emerged as uh, politics. Uh, our independence has been recognized by 62 countries, uh, most of them uh, Western countries. Um, you know, we like to give statistics of you know two thirds of the richest countries, etc. But the reality is that Kosovo is irreversibly independent. It will not change its position. It is presently a partitioned country. Unfortunately, uh, it is an unfinished state in that sense, and it has a lack of international legitimacy in certain parts uh, of the world. Uh, especially in its UN uh, identity, uh, uh, so to speak. So these are all issues that were, will uh, emerge. Um, we declared independence in something that was also uh, a precedent. Uh, people say it was a UDI, a Unilateral Declaration of Independence. Well, actually, it was a CDI, it's a coordinated declaration of independence, because we did it with the Western powers who were the sponsors uh, of that uh, independence. Uh, and therefore, it was uh, something that was uh, a bit ahead of the 20th century when you had uh, people waving the flag. Uh, actually, uh, the flag that we have was not uh, even our own design. There was somebody else who brought it to the Speaker of the Parliament and said, Mr. Speaker, this is your flag. And he went ahead and showed it to, to the auditorium. Uh, in any case, uh, the question of status is not finished. Uh, but not in the sense of, of independence or not. That is not uh, anymore the question. Uh, the question uh, is, after 1989, it is actually about a, a unified Europe, uh, about a, a, a Europe that is free and whole. And uh, the question of Kosovo uh, is, and its status is not anymore about its independence. It will be as with all the others, it will be how Kosovo becomes one of the states of the European Union, finishing a project that started actually in much earlier, but had its impetus in, in 1989, and finishing the negative paradigm that started uh, almost exactly 100 years ago with the First World War. When Kosovo becomes a member of the European Union, that negative cycle will have uh, terminated. And this is uh, what I hope uh, I will see uh, quite soon. Thank you. I actually was wondering, when you mentioned about um, Kosovo being encompassing so many of other countries' aspects, um, with Serbia, with the conflict with Serbia, um, what kind of effect does it have as a host of the uh, community? Yeah, that's uh, much better. So my question is, what kind of effect does um, the conflict with Serbia have in terms of closer being an independent state? Does it minimize its reputation or authority or it with national sovereignty, or does it not really have that much effect? It's just a kind of private affair between two states. I, I, you know, I, there's an emotional, emotional uh, basis for Serbia, for the Serbian reaction. Kosovo was uh, at two times used uh, as part of the Serb national myth. Um, this is a place where 600 years ago uh, Serbia lost its war uh, against the Ottoman Empire. Well, actually, there were other people fighting as well, but uh, Serbian nationalism claimed that it was only, you know, you had the Hungarians and Albanians and, and other people fighting there. In any case, uh, in, at the end of the 19th century, part of the Serbian romanticism, uh, or romantic myth, was based on, on Kosovo, and this is how the modern state of Serbia was built, uh, a kind of a, uh, 
a revival of Serbia after the defeat of the Ottoman uh, Empire. And uh, the modern nationalism uh, of Serbia was also born again in Kosovo with Mr. Milosevic when he delivered again on that field where they lost the war a, a nationalist speech uh, and, and culminating with a movement which actually would start all the wars. So Kosovo had that enormous uh, emotional dimension. It still does to a certain effect. To a certain point, um, I think by now uh, there's a, a population that understands that Kosovo cannot be uh, under Serbian uh, rule. Uh, the question is how to find a way uh, out of the present impasse. And, and I think the, the way out is, again, the European Union. I think there's a need. Uh, there's certainly a, a clear obligation of Serbia to uh, functionalize its relations with all its neighbors before entering the European Union. The European Union, having the uh, Cypriot precedent, will not be inviting anytime soon any country that has uh, problems with mm, neighbors or has internal problems. Please. Uh, we could share it. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. Um, I jotted down three questions. Yeah. In 1993, Serbia bombed or shelled um, Dubrovnik, which is a lovely walled fortress city from 1100 AD. And I'm wondering, at this juncture, wasn't it justifiable for Clinton to intervene? Is one question, you know, to avert any further sequelae, because I, I, in the Croatian community, anyway, that was um, that that was just horrifying. My second question is: Was Americans' um, political delayed response um, perceive was was it due to perceiving the Yugoslav war is is a, a European war that should be owned by Europeans and my third question is did Croatia I'm afraid for this answer but did Croatia along with the other parties in Yugoslavia were they all perpetrators of atrocities I have no Serbian blood in me <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the interesting questions. I, I think question one and two are, are linked. Um, in in uh, 1991, um, Secretary Baker visited uh, Yugoslavia at the time. And he met with all the leaders of the republics and, of, uh, and with us. Um, there were three of us who went to meet the Secretary Baker, Dr. Rogova, Mr. Demachi, and myself. And we talked extensively with him about, uh, about our problems. Um, well, and I think his message was not only to us, but to everybody else, you know, just don't, don't make a big mess out of the situation, you know. Sort it out yourselves and, and find a way out. Uh, and that's where he made this famous pronouncement of, uh, of we ain't got a, a dog in this fight. Uh, and and this, is, this was U.S. policy for, for many years, so it did not start with Clinton. When President Clinton uh, took over, um, if I remember well, he was not focused at all on foreign policy. It was, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, and... and and then that's, that, those were the reactions. I think uh, as, as he was in office and after Secretary Christopher, when the State Department changed and we had Madeleine Albright, I think the focus then changed also on the Yugoslav wars. For me, it was clear not only with uh, Dubrovnik, but before Dubrovnik, that there was a need for an international intervention. In fact, we, I think uh, even, even before at the first stages of the Croatian war in, in Vukovar, we were asking for international intervention there because it was quite evident that, that pe people would be killed and that this would, this would simply deteriorate. And it was evident in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1992 how things would be, uh, would be functioning. I went to see President Izetbegovic 
uh, I think, two weeks before the war. Uh, and he was still hoping that he would get away with, uh, with it. You know, he would he would get away with uh, with not having the war in Bosnia. Uh, the wars in Yugoslavia in the 90s were caught, were somewhere between the uh, the disbelief, both internally and externally, that things could go so wrong. Nobody actually believed the capacity of destruction uh, that was evolving. Uh, it's like watching a hurricane or a tornado and saying, it won't, it won't get me. You know, it's going the other way. It's, uh, it's, it's not reaching this way. Now, was Croatia a perpetrator? Not as a country, uh, although uh, Croatia was involved in, the Croatian army was involved, or parts of the Croatian army were involved in, in crimes uh, as well. Uh, especially uh, in its correlation with the Bosnian Croatian uh, army, the HVO, uh, which did perpetrate uh, crimes against humanity in, in, in Herzegovina, especially. Please, sorry. The, 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 the gentleman has a microphone. Sorry. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I have a question that's linked by a thematic question, and that is, to what extent have you been surprised by the trajectories of change in Kosovo over the last 20 years? And I'm thinking in particular about two moments. On the one hand, you know, to what extent could you have anticipated the KLA becoming so influential in opposition to Rogova? And can you anticipate a future in which, uh, is it Alban Corti, could have so much influence in his self-determination movement over the present authorities in Kosovo? Um, you know, if you had asked me how things would look like in 1989, I would not have given you a, a good answer. Uh, I. To be honest, I, I thought that communism would be crumbling. I didn't think it would be crumbling so fast. I did not think that Yugoslavia would be dying in such a way. I thought that there was going to be some sort of fed confederal arrangement, uh, uh, at least. Uh, or uh, if, in any case, if there is going to be, uh, if there is going to be a, a, a dissolution of Yugoslavia, I actually thought that there would be a. <coughs> Uh, one of the options would be to have a, a unified Albanian state, uh, actually much, uh, uh, much clearer outcome than an independent uh, republic. But these were all options in 1989. You, you know, we had debates about everything, and everything looked uh, so distant, but at the same time so possible. And as I, 89 was a magical year. You could, you could actually think about everything uh, at at the time. Um, did I anticipate the KLA uh, opposition? Yes, I, I thought that. I thought that because we were so passive in our nonviolent resistance, that there would be a time soon when there would be an armed movement, uh, and it was, e I think, easily foreseeable at, at that uh, point. Uh, did I think they would be so, so disorganized? No, I thought it would be a much more organized military. Uh, movement, uh, a guerrilla, but uh, this is what we had. Uh, now, I don't think Kurti is actually the, so influential as, as one would suggest. He's, uh, he's a man of uh, a great degree of intelligence. He has uh, some uh, political positions that would not necessarily fit into a uh, a democratic trend uh, of the society, but I don't. I don't think he's uh, so influential. I actually think he's an added value in in the way he, critic, he critically uh, sees the, the development. Uh, I may not agree with many of these things, but I think that it is necessary to have a degree of criticism within that within our society, such as his. Uh, the, the lady behind, uh, if, if you will, the microphone, yes. 
What's happened to the status of relations with the minority Serbs now that you read about Serbia regarding that as part of Serbia itself? Uh, yeah, Serbia is making matters a bit more complicated for the Kosovo Serbs. Uh, about 30 to 40 percent of the Kosovo Serbs live above the uh, Ibar River uh, and, and in a territory which is contiguous to, to Serbia. And the rest live uh, south of the river, uh, dispersed. Uh, in what they call enclaves, uh, but basically living close to Albanians. Uh, those who are living in enclaves, uh, the, the situation has, has become much better, and there's a higher degree of communication between Serbs and Albanians. There's a lack of communication between Serbs and Albanians north of the river, where basically there is a, a rather lawless uh, uh, frozen conflict kind of, of territory. And we will have elections on November the 15th, uh, which is quite soon, in 10 days. And we hope that, I hope that, that there will be Serb participation, because there's a need for an authentic democratic Serb leadership in, in Kosovo. I have my doubts, though, whether there will be such a participation north of the river. I think there will be more participation south of the river, and that we might see local, municipal, uh, Serb leadership emerge. So you, you mentioned the word precedent, right, in your, in your speech, and then you, you backed away immediately from it, right? But of course, Kosovo is also inevitably, right, a yeah. precedent that is brought up in in many different ways, probably, but certainly it, it comes up, right? And you have about Darfur, it comes up when people talk about, you know, post-national sovereignty. It's become, a, you know, really a case in political theory, in uh, diplomatic debate. I mean, in all, so what is your sense of that? I mean, what is the... the uh, so what? What is also, on the one hand, I want to say the, the official position of the of the Kosovo government now about uh, this use of precedent, but also in general in public opinion. I mean, how how is that language received in Kosovo itself? I, I don't know. The, the, the Kosovo politicians are instructed almost to say that there is no there is no precedent. Um, and it looks silly when we go around and, and say, you know, we're not a president, we're not a president. Uh, you, you can be a, if you have sufficient force, uh, uh, you can use anything as a president. But I think what we are and what we ought to be is a positive president. Uh, there's a way to address uh, crises uh, by multilateralism and by an engagement that actually creates the conditions to make a decision. And I think uh, in, in places where you have these kinds of uh, conflicts, there should be a multilateral, uh, a multilateral path that uses the precedence of Kosovo, the positive ones, uh, in order to create the conditions. And, and it's a basic two-step approach. You cannot resolve a Let's take the question of the most difficult, one of the most difficult questions today, the question of Palestine. I don't think Palestine could have, I don't think Palestine can be resolved without a safe and secure environment in which there could be a political process that would generate then the conditions for a solution. You cannot have a solution for Palestine if you uh, continuously bomb or, or arrest or harass, or if, as a Palestinian, you go around uh, putting bombs or, or shelling or uh, sending rockets, it, it, it is not very conducive to a, uh, a decision-making process that, that could enable also confidence in, at the end of that process. Uh, so you need actually to create conditions in order for people to make a, a decision. Uh, now, is this a perfect example? Of course it's not. Uh, Kosovo has its big problems. It had its big problems in administration. It had its big problems in the fact that it was not entirely a consensual decision of the international community on its independence. But you cannot have uh, everything. Uh, you, you simply have to deal uh, with things as they are. Last question. I think I will 
ask you a question about the nines, where we started. And I wanted to ask you about one of the nines to which you alluded. Um, and it's, it's especially interesting in Kosovo 1389 as this kind of moment that is both embedded in all sorts of visions of the past, but also can be used as a charter for different visions of what futures might be in Kosovo. And this is obviously related to the previous questions about local Serb views of the Kosovar um, independence and so on. I'm wondering if you could say anything about your sense of 1389's futures in the new Kosovo, you know, in term, both in terms of its members of the mm. past and also how it's looked forward to in the future of this new entity. I, I hope I'm not. I hope I'm not misinterpreted, but I see 1389 as a touristic venue. Uh, I see, a, I see a way in which we can attract tourism uh, and, and, and people getting there. Um, I do understand the sensibility uh, around it, but as all sensibility, you can play it, uh, you can play it negatively. Uh, or you can actually build on it. And I think what we ought to be doing is building on it. Uh, initially, I suggested in, early on in, in the year 2000, 2001, that all the cultural monuments of the Serbs, which were under K4 protection, should not be under K4 protection. But they should be under Kosovo police protection, because people should assume responsibility for the heritage of Kosovo. Regardless of the fact that this is not an Albanian, you know, we should have had Albanian cops uh, around those monuments to understand that they're protecting their own heritage. This is the Kosovar heritage, because this is what we're trying to build. And, uh, and also to, to raise an awareness which, which people who don't understand the others don't get it. In one of those, uh, and this is the anecdote with which I, I think I ought to be finished, in the, in the 60s and the 70s, many buses from Belgrade used to come to see the, the field of the battle. Uh, and the guy who, who would tour them would show them, you know, this is where, they, where this happened and the other happened. And, and then he would show the last, the, the, the morning of the battle. Was, and he would say, on this side was our army. And on that side was the Serbian army. And these were all Serbian tourists. And he was speaking in Serbian. I said, wait a minute. What do you mean on our side is our army? And, uh, well, he said, I'm a Turk. And this guy was a, a, you know, a Turk who was showing them the, the, the battle. And not only, when you try to understand what the other means as we is when you actually get it. <laughs> right, on that note. <laughs>